Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin at the top of the hour and it will be recorded. Connect with the campaign for grade level reading on social media, on Facebook, like the page campaign for GLR and on Twitter, follow the account at reading by third. Please use the hashtag learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar and we'll be sure to retweet it. We encourage you to share your thoughts, your questions and reflections and observations on social media. Once again, the campaign wants to connect with you on social media, on Facebook, like the page, campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. The webinar will begin shortly. It'll be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, The Science of Reading, Applying the Science in the Classroom. My name is Sarah Torian, and I'm a consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and am managing this weekly online learning series. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of really quick housekeeping details with you. First of all, I'd encourage you to introduce yourself. Let us know your name, organization, and the name of the GLR coalition that you're a part of if you're a member of a GLR coalition using the chat box on your Zoom screen. And please be sure to um, select to all panelists and attendees in the to option of the chat box so that everybody can see who's in the room with us today. Second, I just wanted to share that all webinar attendees will be participating in listen-only mode during today's webinar, and that's to avoid any background noises or distractions during the presentations, but we do strongly encourage your active engagement throughout today's conversations, and I'd encourage you to share any thoughts or reflections that might come to you during, during these presentations using the chat box on your Zoom screen, and to pose any questions that you would like to ask of our presenters using the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Now, for those of you who've been joining in for these conversations since they launched last September, this is a little bit new. Um, in the past month or so, we now have access to a dedicated Q&A box. So I'd encourage you to look for that when you're posing your questions. It makes it much easier for us to track them and make sure they don't get buried underneath comments and reflections in the chat box. Third, just wanted to remind you that uh, today's webinar is being recorded and that a link to that recording along with the slide deck and other related resources that are shared during today's conversation will be sent out in an email to you early next week. They typically go out on Monday, but since next Monday is a holiday, it'll probably go out um, a day or so after that, but keep an eye out for that and feel free to share it with your colleagues or view the, the recording again. And then finally, just wanted to give you a brief or a heads up that we'll be posting a very brief survey poll after the presentations are complete during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And I'd encourage you to take just a couple of quick moments to share your thoughts and feedback with us in that. Helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement and making sure that the format and content of these online learning conversations are meeting your needs and supporting your work. Now I'd like to share just a little bit of background about the GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar series. As you can see on the screen in front of you, we've got a number of great sessions planned in the coming weeks for our regularly scheduled 3 p.m. time slot on Tuesdays, as well as um, some additional special webinars that we're also hosting on Tuesdays in the 12.30 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time slot, um, including we've got a double header up next week, so just wanted to give you a heads up about that so that you can plan to um, possibly join in for both of these conversations next week. 
Um, we have now hosted more than 35 webinars since the launch of GLR Learning Tuesdays last September, so I would also encourage you to check out CLIP. That's the campaign's Community Learning for Impact and Improvement platform, where you can find a growing archive of resources shared from these conversations, including all of the webinar recordings, all of the slide decks, and other related resources exploring the best science, ideas, and programs related to ensuring early school success for more children from low-income families. If you're not familiar with CLIP, I've posted a link um, in the chat box where you can uh, figure out how to join CLIP, where you can access all of these resources. And then I hope you'll continue to save this date and time and make plans to join in for more of these online learning conversations. But now for today's conversation. Um, last month, we hosted the first webinar on the science of reading with Emily Hanford and Andy Rotherham and Jenny McKenzie joining us to share what the science tells us about how children learn to read and to call attention to the gap between what the science tells us and what is actually happening in classrooms across the country. So today, we're going to continue that conversation as we focus on how we can close that gap, kind of the what how we can apply the science in the classroom to ensure that the science of reading is guiding and informing literacy instruction and support in classrooms and communities, all of our classrooms and communities. And to guide us through that conversation, um, Monroe Richardson is joining us again to serve as moderator today. Monroe is the executive director at Read Charlotte, the grade level reading community initiative in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he's bringing his 20 plus years of experience to bear in that role, mobilizing the community to use research, data, and strategic funding to advance local efforts to improve children's language and literacy development from birth through third grade. So welcome, Monroe. Thank you so much for joining us again, for continuing this conversation with our network, and for serving as moderator today. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I want to welcome all of you that uh, have joined us today on another Learning Tuesday. Um, we're excited to continue this series on uh, this, applying the science of reading in the classroom. Um, we've got an exciting group of panelists today, which who I'm really excited for you to hear from. Um, as we find ourselves, um, you know, more than two and a half months into school closures across our country, it's become more than evident that so many children in our communities, especially the most vulnerable children who are at risk before the COVID-19 crisis, are today at greater risk of significant loss in reading and other academic areas. And so for our communities that are focused on early literacy, um, early literacy has to be an important part of the recovery from COVID-19. And it's really important that we put a spotlight on helping children across our country and across all of our campaign communities to recover from reading loss. Um, to be able to do that well, though, we have to pay attention to what are the most effective practices um, to help children uh, be able to recover, um, which means we need to understand the science of reading and how children learn to read. And so I'm excited today to have um, our panelists today to talk about this. Um, and our hope is that you'll be able to learn some things today that you'll be able to take back and begin to think about how you can apply them in your communities. Um, our first uh, panelist is um, Faith Ann Butcher who is the Chief Impact Officer of um, the United Way of Westchester and Putnam. Um, she's been there since October 2019 and helps um, the organization create lasting impacts in the communities it serves by using holistic approaches and developing partnerships with experts and stakeholders in the public and private sectors. And an important pillar of this work is implementing programs that enable more students to read on grade level by the end of third grade. We also have Dr. Sarah Siegel, who's the Vice President for Research and Practice at Learning Innovations. Uh, her research is focused on the development of reading, writing, and spelling skills in elementary and middle school students, as well as educational technology, writing instruction, classroom observation, uh, and writing assessment development. And she now applies that research in her work supporting the HUI software platform and online professional development. And we're excited for you to hear about that today. Um, in addition, we also have um, Todd Hanson, who is Vice President of the Center for Engaged Philanthropy at the Orange County Community Foundation. 
in California. And over the past 19 years, Todd has worked to inspire a passion for lifelong philanthropy in Orange County, faithfully steward the intentions of the foundation's donors and catalyze community impact. He advises the foundation's most active um, donor advisors, private and family foundations, to help them achieve their philanthropic goals and helps lead many of the foundation's community leadership initiatives, one of which is OC Reads. And uh, finally, our commentator today is Angela Rutherford. She has uh, more than 25 years of experience in public education. For the last 15 years, she has been a professor at the University of Mississippi, where she has also served as the director of the Center for Excellence in Literacy Instruction. She has consulted and advised states, districts, and schools in the implementation of evidence-based literacy programs and is a nationally certified trainer of language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, which many of you today know as letters. So we're excited to have all of these uh, fantastic members of our panel today and for you to hear from them. Um, so first I wanna start with um, Sarah Siegel. Uh, Sarah, you have, you worked with Carol Connor when she was conducting research into how students learn to read. Can you share with us today a little bit about what Carol and that research team learned about different student profiles and the need for differentiation in types of instruction? Sure, absolutely. Um, and hey everyone, I'm so happy to be here to talk about this today. Um, so one of the big things that we found um, through Carol's work was that it's not only about applying the science of reading in these overarching theories that we know about, but it's also the fact that different students respond to these things differently. So some aspects might benefit students more in one area than it benefits um, a different student with a different profile. And so um, one of the kind of overarching concepts that I want to really get across today is that different kids need different things to be successful. This doesn't mean that certain areas, um, especially some of these ideas that we know are supported by research overall aren't effective, but it means they might be more effective in some cases than others. And so I really want to kind of think about this as the central piece here that is also why it's so hard to apply the science of reading, right? If every student is going to respond slightly differently, how do we really put these overarching theories into practice in our classrooms? And so um, to kind of tie this idea in overall, I want to go back and connect this idea to the science of reading and also to my background as a developmental psychologist and kind of this connection between how students learn how to read and write and also child development overall. Um, so first, if you were at that first session, um, Emily kind of touched on some of these things, but I wanna make sure that everyone's familiar with them. Um, there is the overarching kind of view that's often presented in science of reading conversations called the simple view of reading. And this essentially spells out the fact that reading comprehension or reading for understanding our final goal for um, teaching kids to read is really made up of two parts, decoding and language comprehension. And so students can fall anywhere on the spectrum of those two areas. So some common examples we might see are an English language learner might have really good word recognition. They're learning how to decode these words just along with their grade level peers, but might have lower language comprehension where they're not as clear on understanding what they're actually reading. Um, we may have other students who have really good oral language, vocabulary, comprehension skills, um, but poor decoding. And so those students might fall in a different quadrant on the spectrum, um, but both of those components are playing a role for reading comprehension. Um, the other thing that's really important to consider here, right, is if decoding or language comprehension is zero, the whole equation falls apart. So we really need to support both of these skill areas. Um, the other graphic that's really commonly used when we're kind of thinking about the science of reading and these overarching concepts is Scarborough's rope. So this is essentially really telling that same story, right? Comprehension or skilled reading here is made up of two components, language comprehension and word recognition. And it's a bunch of the subskills that make up these two components, as well as this increased automaticity and strategic use of these different skills that lead to that skilled reading comprehension. Um, but as I mentioned, Neither one of these really take into account um, student development changes over time. Um, so the question is, if different students need different things, how does development play a role? And so um, this is the way I like to kind of pull up these things together is um, this is called Broffenbrenner's bioecological model. And essentially the takeaway here is that there's all of these different variables playing a role, right? So you can see the little blackboard diagram representing school but there's also other factors that are gonna be influencing how and what a student learns when. And so the other piece that we really wanna start thinking about is how time can play a role into understanding 
student um, learning and how specifically reading comprehension develops over time. Um, so there's kind of two different ways to really think about this idea. The first is kind of from a historical time point. And so that's where I want to start. And so um, what you're seeing here is this drastic difference between how oral language or vocabulary really emerged in the human timeline versus written language. So you can see here spoken language has been around for a long time. And, um, you know, evolutionarily, you can probably think of some reasons that might be the case. Uh, if you can understand one grunt means food, another means danger, you're going to survive a lot longer. A lot of beneficial um, areas that's impacting. However, um, written language really took much, much longer to emerge. And it actually wasn't until the printing press was invented in 1439, where written language was actually available to the public. And so you can just see as kind of thinking about it from a historical perspective, there's a much different um, impact that understanding verbal communication and learning to read has played um, based on this timeline. But the other way we can think about this is just an individual child development. And so um, the big takeaway here is that language is an innate skill that's learned through exposure. And so um, this graph here is showing an infant um, from ages six months to 12 across the x-axis there. And you can see um, really early on, about six to eight months of age, they can actually differentiate between different sounds regardless of language. So this is a, an example of a infant born into an English speaking home that was then played sounds in either Hindi, which is the blue bars, or a, um, another language, I have it written on the slide, I will not try to pronounce it, um, but these two other languages, and they essentially played two different phonemes or sounds that are important in those languages. And up into eight months, um, this infant could distinguish between the sounds, they're able to understand that the sound had changed as well as in English, but look at how fast that ability drops off. By the time they're 10 to 12 months old, they're only recognizing differences in Hindi about 20% of the time. So you start to narrow down the language differences, the sounds that are meaningful for you, for your communication. And this is something, you know, that it wasn't explicitly taught during those 12 months. It's just something that infants automatically start doing when exposed to language. So Sarah, this is all really interesting. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, how does this play out across the K-3 space? And how does what children need change over time as they move through the early grades? Um, great question. And this is exactly why it's so important to remember that um, there are these differences, right? And so if we're saying language is something that's going to be developed based on experiences a child has or vocabulary, um, that's going to start developing at birth. And again, if we think back to that um, developmental model, there are many different um, variables or components that might be impacting that growth. Um, however, decoding or the actual act of learning to read is not an innate process. And so um, this is where I really like to lay out the kind of difference in development between something that's happening innately through those experiences or requires explicit direct instruction. And so um, if you look at this graph, we're really calling out those same two components from the simple view of reading. Um, here they're labeled decoding and vocabulary, if you think of that as kind of language comprehension. And um, the blue line represents those decoding skills. So they really don't start developing and growing until maybe preschool, kindergarten, when that um, student is now learning that words are made up of sounds, so song, sounds can be represented by letters, and combining those and practicing those allows them to automatically and fluently start translating the symbols that make up our words into something they're actually understanding. And another way I kind of like to think about this is you're essentially, from kindergarten to about third grade, trying to get that decoding ability to catch up to a student's language or understanding. And this is where we see a huge swift switch developmentally as well from learning to read to reading to learn, where once you have those um, decoding skills, you can really start to learn new words, new concepts in uh, a comprehension setting where before you were learning just to decode the words that you were already using in your oral language. Um, so I think development really plays a huge role in how we think about these things kind of coming together to form that final goal of reading for understanding. Well, this is um, really interesting. So, I mean, you've given us a lot of insights into you know, how, what the research and science tells us. Um, can you share a little bit with us now how we apply this research and both in the classroom and across systems? Absolutely. Um, and this is where the central idea comes back around, right? So now we're kind of understanding another variable that's at play here, development, 
but we still haven't touched on the fact that if different kids are all over the map here, what do they need to be successful? And so that's really where we're going to get into the how to apply the science of reading in the classroom. Um, and so the first thing that I really want to kind of point out here is there are two levels to thinking about how to apply this. And if you've read Emily, any of Emily Hanford's articles or heard her presentation, um, one of the things she touched on was that even as teachers are exposed to this information and start using it, they often feel like they're all alone or they kind of have to hide it. And so in our work in our current school partners, we've really seen that the number one component that's needed to be in place here is support at the systems level. So you have a teacher who's central to this, but they need support from the community, from state policy, and especially from their district to actually put these um, science of reading theories into action in their classroom. Um, so what does that look like? Um, so first we have a fragmented landscape uh, in the current educational setting. So many teachers have told us, you know, I have assessments over here. They're not connected to my curriculum at all. I have all of these different initiatives. It seems like nothing is moving together. Um, and it also means then that it's really hard to get aligned. And one of the reasons that we're really seeing this is because research and practice don't talk to each other. So we have a lot of these great theories and things like the simple view of reading and the science of reading, but they're just not making it into the classroom in a way that's applicable or helpful or even making that jump at all. And the other piece that seems to happen from this is what teachers are being provided is not nuanced enough or kind of broad enough to really start aligning these separate pieces. So the teacher's trapped in the middle there, a little bit frustrated because they're getting these tiny bits and pieces that may have been um, evidence-based, but they're not fitting into an overarching theory. So um, if we can create this systems alignment, it paints a much different picture. And this is what that can look like. So thinking back to that previous slide here, um, first, everything is now pointed in the same direction. If we know K3 literacy is a critical component, we can start aligning all of these apparently disconnected pieces into one now. So we're all trying to face the same direction. The other thing that's really helpful is once we're aligning, there is a, the ability for us to fill in the gaps. If we know something's missing, we can fill it in. And the final piece here is that we now have a lot more room on the slide, right? So instead of feeling like, okay, there's just another initiative, it's just one more thing, we're really saying, how does that fit into this overarching goal that we're facing? And so if districts can create that kind of supportive system for a teacher, there is a lot more ability to now start applying what's actually evidence-based. So one of the ways we do that, and um, a lot of my research currently is based on this, um, support system called the HOI Professional Support System. And that is what we use to really start connecting some specific pieces here. You can see them on our diagram that teachers and districts are feeling are really not connected and start aligning them to that central goal. But there's one more piece that still needs to be addressed here and that's really the teacher in the classroom. So if the teacher supported the system alignment is in place, how can they start applying the science of reading for their students? And this is also where we really now get into information about different students needing different things to be successful. Um, what our work has found is that children can enter a classroom with a number of these different profiles, high word recognition, low vocabulary, high on both. Um, and all of these things have different implications for what they actually need to receive from the teacher. So um, here's just one kind of simplified example. This red line represents the amount of time a student entering a first grade classroom needs to spend on teacher managed code-focused instruction. So when we say code-focused, we mean anything that has to do with phonics, decoding, turning those sounds and um, letters into actual words that they're reading. And so um, the x-axis here demonstrates where a student's reading ability might actually be. Even though this is a first grade classroom, you might be entering at a kindergarten level, at a second grade reading level, and anywhere in between. So if we do have a student entering this classroom at a kindergarten level, so almost a year behind, they need about 30 minutes of teacher managed code focused instruction a day to meet the end goal of reading at grade level. But if you enter that classroom and you are reading at grade level already, right where that arrow is pointing, you only need 10 minutes. So all of these aspects that we're really promoting through phonics instruction and having the other type of instruction that we usually consider is called meaning focused instruction, so more of that vocabulary or language components, um, both are important, but for different kids, they're more important in different areas. What makes this a little complex is there are actually a lot of different things going on in the classroom, right? So I mentioned that we have code or meaning focused instruction and we can also have teacher or child managed delivery. 
So um, students are going to benefit, um, some students are going to benefit more from teacher guided instruction where they're getting explicit instruction from the teacher and being able to ask questions. And some students, if they, you know, just need to be introduced to a topic and are good to go, they're going to benefit more from child managed instruction in those areas. And so we've actually been able to um, create these algorithms that allow us to tell teachers not only where students are at, but what instruction they need. And so, um, as you can see from this graph, that this is pretty complex. And so we've actually harnessed technology to provide these recommendations for teachers. And that's where the A2I professional support system really comes in, is instead of having to look at all these, we always call that the spaghetti graph, um, look at all these crazy different recommendations, we can just produce the individualized um, needs of each student for the teacher. And um, through this software platform, we're able to start now saying, here is what the science of reading says, here's what the individual students need to be successful, and here's how the teacher can use that information. Um, but again, all of this has to operate within this aligned system. And so that's where um, the full support system comes into play. And so we found that we need to identify where students are at through assessments, provide those instructional recommendations and align to materials and practices teachers are already using to meet those student needs, but finally, there is this additional need for customized support that again, help teachers directly translate the information they're getting into practice in the classroom. And so we have embedded professional development and support that allows that true systems alignment to be put into play um, in every single classroom. Um, so the overarching kind of takeaway here then is that the research has really shown teaching kids to read is really complex because different kids need different things to be successful. But the, through the help of this alignment, we can really start now recommending to teachers exactly what students need. We know what instruction will benefit what kids most, and um, the challenge is just putting that into place. Um, and so I know that's some of the pieces that Faith and Todd are going to touch on too, is how, how does that really look? All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Faith, uh, would like to get you in the conversation. Um, sure. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about the grade level um, reading campaign in Westchester County and how, how have you been supporting the application of uh, science of reading in the classroom there and, and can you tell us about any results you've seen so far? Yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely. So if you look at this slide right here, you can see all the um, different school districts that we have within Westchester County. And you can actually see on the, um, the right hand side the key that shows, you know, we have many, uh, we actually have a very broad array of schools, some that are, you know, some of the top notch schools in throughout the country, as well as some of the, um, you know, poorest and uh, really need some help districts. So through as the campaign for grade level reading, we really focus on the schools that are yellow, uh, orange and red to really help those schools, which generally have um, lower, you know, de uh, demog you know, demographics, lower per capita, uh, and um, generally different kinds of populations really help them, you know, reach that same level as those areas that are hit in blue. So, you know, we really work towards those things. So I can give you some background on how United Way got involved. So we can just go to the next one. So in 2009, uh, United Way of Westchester and Putnam decided that it was going to uh, have early literacy be one of its pillars. Uh, we focus on education, income, and health. And with the uh, education component, we really understood that early literacy was, a, was an important component for future success. That, you know, being able to read on grade level by the end of third grade was a milestone that really showed, you know, indicators for future success. So we started out off with some programs, you know, different reading initiatives, and, you know, then in 2015, we started our United to Read program, which was giving out literacy kits uh, to children in daycare centers and Head Starts uh, so that kids had books, because we found that 61% of children from low income or moderate income families didn't have new books in their homes. So this was a way to get more books in, uh, into the hands of kids because we know the more books that a children sees, you know, that's also another indicator later on for their success. So we were giving out those kits and then uh, through uh, different uh, degrees of partnerships and everything like that, 
in 2015, we became um, our partners with Learning Ovations, uh, in which case uh, our CEO at the time, was her specialty was early literacy, so she really thought it was uh, a great um, partnership with the science behind A to I, which was great, and they had actually gotten the funding from the Department of Education. So we actually, the, you know, it was great to get that funding, but they needed schools to actually participate in the, in the pilot of the, of, this, of the study. So in 2017, we started advocating to all the schools uh, to be using A to I. And there was, uh, you could be one of three types of schools. Either you can get it all funded, you can get it partially funded, or you, you, you know, you would be more of a pilot or the control group where you wouldn't have it. And um, we were very fortunate. We were working with the, uh, the BOCES in our area to go through the different uh, school districts because the head of their curriculum saw the potential in A to I. Uh, and we were able to get two school districts in our county to participate uh, in the A to I study, and that was uh, Elmsford and Peekskill. And so they started their first school year in uh, last year, which was the 18-19 school year. So, you know, just so we can go a little bit more about our first year into the, uh, of the study. So we had the first year of the study, we actually had, we had 763 students in 32 classrooms. Now to understand these schools, because again, um, Westchester is one of the most affluent you know, uh, counties in the United States, but the reality is for the Elmsford School District, 80% of the students are minority and 38% of them are economically disadvantaged and they only had a 38% uh, reading proficiency level. Uh, in the Peekskill School District, they had a 92% minority uh, level and 74 economically disadvantaged and they only had like a 30% reading proficiency level. So these were schools that had, you know, obstacles to overcome. And so if we could show through these schools that starting where you are and using A to I, you know, were able to, you know, raise your raised reading levels, then it was showing that, you know, this was something that was worthwhile. And we knew that by the end of the study, which was supposed to be next year and because of, you know, the COVID-19, you know, I think that's a little up in the air right now. Um, but because, but then what we figured is we're truly going to see the results of this during next year's ELA tests, where we'll really be able to capture. But we've already seen uh, the level of uh, we've already seen some of the improvements. So if in our letters to meaning uh, category, which is um, the the, vo the vocab um, the comprehension, I'm sorry, it was part of the of the A to I program. Uh, you can see that there was, you know, we can show you the difference between what the study was. And for anyone who doesn't know, in A to I, the studies show that if you started in kindergarten or first grade, by third grade, 94% of the children who are using A to I can read on grade level. Uh, and so what you can actually see here is that the studies are the lines in yellow and in, in green, all right? And in both uh, schools, uh, Dixon is uh, Elmsford and Woodside is in Peekskill, in both those schools, the children were doing better than the study, which was absolutely amazing. And that was when we were like, and we were, that was the moment we were, that was the aha moment where we were all in. You know, we had supported A to I and we had advocated it through all the school districts, but there, um, there were principals and superintendents who were, were, you know, who saw those results that were like, oh my God. Uh, the superintendent for the Elmsford School District is actually in talks with, the, with learning ovations about making his entire district use ADI. So it's really, you know, it's, it's going beyond that. But if you can uh, also, just so you can see, while well, these charts are not, why these graphs are great, you can see in the charts. So you can see where the kids start, and we can see our kindergarten and our first grades, and then it's their improvement level as compared to the study. Now, you can see that they improve. Remember, school is only nine months long, okay? So to have an improvement, and these are school districts that were only getting an improvement level of, you know, three to four months, if not a deficiency in, in grade levels, you can see that they, you know, for, for Dixon in um, letters to meeting, you know, the kindergarten had over a nine-month improvement, 
and in, in first grade, they had over a year improvement in less than nine months. And, and I saw somebody had a question before about when there's dual language in the, you know, uh, in the classrooms. In, I can actually, I know that there's classrooms in both kindergarten and first grade in Dixon that use dual, langu dual language classes and use A to I. So I actually, I, I've been in those classrooms. So, and then in Woodside, you could see the same thing that they're still they're still having you know the improvements in in these in these uh, classrooms above the study growth and these are more than double what their what their districts are normally having. If we can go then looking at the word match uh, studies and these are the the vocab you can also see here that the uh, peak skill in Elmsford districts are again they're both doing over a year improvement within that time. In fact, the first graders over at Carl Dixon had a two-year improvement in one year. They were able to act, you know, act in nine months. Again, you got to remember the, the, the nine months of the school year. They were able to improve their reading at to a second, you know, by a two-year level. Uh, I don't know which, what uh, their reading program that they were using is. Um, I can, you know, find that out. But I know that the the main part of the part that they that they they credit this to is, you know, using the A to I and the, indiv the individualized uh, teaching and that you being able to figure out the minutes and the coding that's needed for, the, for, for each student. So, um, and I can, and but the greatest part was that we weren't just getting these results from the assessments in A to I. We got third party confirmations. And that was like one of the great parts is that iReady is another assessment tool that's used in the schools and the iReady data showed that they had a massive improvement. If you look in between, again, the scores in between 2018 and the scores in 2019, right, you, you can see that there's a drastic difference in, into those, you know, dub, almost doubling those scores in both ELA and math. One of the benefits, one of the things that they, they weren't expecting but was a bonus was when you improve your ELA scores, when you improve your, your, your reading literacy, your math skills become better also because there's so many word problems in today's math world. So that was one of the benefits that they actually had to see also, which was a great thing uh, to be able to, to play a part. And there, like I said, if you can see the jump, they were planning on going from a 38 in 2018 that by 2022 going to a 75 and a 70. And that's based off of, uh, you know, the 100 you know, being the chart, and again, being, you know, at, from a 38% level of proficiency to a 75% level of proficiency, in, in, you know, in four years is, is tremendous. So that's, um, but, you know, we have more individualized, we, you know, this has worked beyond expectations as far as, you know, the, um, the what we've seen come out of this. Uh, as far as an individual goes for uh, letters to, to meaning, uh, we have Fabiola Diaz, who, you know, had an improve, improvement of one year, two months. Uh, and then we also had, for the entire classroom, having that, you know, being able to improve by over two years in one month, in, one, you know, in nine months' worth of time, was just, you know, a great thing to see and put, really put those children on the right track for the future. Um, but you don't have to just take this from what I said. You know, we actually have, you know, we, we have... Uh, a video from the school when they were on News 12, our local news channel. Maybe. The Crawford explains. Blending blueberries. Learning to read and pronounce words can be a lot of fun. <laughs> But not every student gets the hang of it at the same time. That's why the Elmsford School District, with the help of United Way of Westchester and Putnam, rolled out A2I last year, a reading tool being used around the country. First grade teacher Courtney Villardo. Can I play too? Yeah. Says it helps assess what each student is struggling with. 
If they can spell CVC words, then they get into longer words for them to spell. And then it's auditory where they're listening to words and choosing the two words that would go together. Students are broken up into groups with kids at the same level. Wait, raise your hand. Each group is given personalized lessons suited for their goals. The children are actually getting to take ownership of their own learning because some of their learning is teacher matched with the teacher and some of their learning is child managed and they are accomplishing goals together and growing together. Out of the 189 students in kindergarten through first grade who participated in the A2I program last year, 93% were six months ahead of schedule. There you go. School superintendent Dr. Mark Bayako said they plan to bring A2I into higher grade levels. We had 13 students just to get in the weeds a little bit. Uh, that needed uh, tier three intervention, which is our highest level of intervention. By the end of the year, we were down to zero. United Way of Westchester and Putnam hope to inspire other schools to benefit from A2I2. One of the best and proven interventions to rise out of poverty is education. And the best form of education is investing in early childhood literacy. And the investment, they say, is G-R-E-A-T. Great so far. In Elmsford, Samantha Crawford. News 12. Faith, that was really great to um, really get your perspective, um, particularly in your role of um, leading the local campaign in Westchester and Putnam. And, um, you know, I, I know that when you all look at the work you do, you're looking um, holistically. So um, what happens in the classroom is obviously, you know, critical, but um, for children's literacy, but what also happens outside the classroom is important as well. So how is the United Way of Westchester and Putnam in your role helping to provide additional resources to engage and support families as part of your overall effort um, leading the campaign in Westchester and Putnam? So as you said, leading the campaign for the grade level learning, uh, we have actually taken, you know, the, the different pillars within the campaign and said, okay, how can we, you know, apply those to our program so we can actually best help those schools that are using the ETI um, tool. And that was what, how we had actually looked at it is because we had been pounding our heads for years on early literacy and how do we do this. And, you know, you go to funders, and I'm sure most of you have been there, you know, where you want to do this stuff, and it sounds really great, and it's a feel-good, but they say, well, what's your data? You know, how do you track it? And we were, you know, so by using A to I and getting the assessments, we were able to track as a whole the use of A to I as well as these other tools and these other programs into, into, in a way that made it more appealing for funders and also allowed us to help with the messaging of, you know, doing all these things are able to help the students. So um, in our programs, we have a couple different components to our school readiness because school readiness takes on different roles. Excuse me. The first way we have school readiness is the fact that learning starts at birth. And we know that, you know, but, you know, how do you do that? And I know it does, you know, it sounds like a funny thing to actually hear me talking about, you know, learning from birth and here and, and seeing these, you know, this is actually uh, staff from Wegmans who are building a born learning trail at the uh, Dixon Elementary School. Uh, our born learning trails are made to help uh, families and, you know, caretakers interact with the children and help stir the, the children's imaginations. And so this was a great way for us to have our corporate partners team up you know, with into into one of our programs and work with the school district and be able to help with the families also. So when the children are going to school in the morning or during the summer, you know, when they're going for a walk because where the school is located and it's in a very walkable area, uh, they can actually go through and go to the different signs and go to the bench and talk about the different stories and come up with, you know, uh, identifying flowers and everything like that. So we have, you know, the school readiness program through our born learning and through and through Wegmans. But then we also have, you know, the early literacy component of it. And our early literacy component are our literacy kits. And we have a partnership with uh, Scholastic 
as well as other diff um, other uh, donations for book contributions. And we actually give uh, we give the books these literacy kits, which are the blue bags that you see over to the side in the photos. And our literacy kits include at, uh, at least three books, with uh, two of them being bilingual, uh, especially in, in these kind of in these communities. Uh, a, a songbook that's bilingual. We have activities and information that's all in there for for parents to, inter to engage with the children, so that. Uh, they can actually get these books and feel the books because we know that that's important too. It's not just what you're seeing on the screen, but being able to see that, it's really a great way to be able to get that in. And we, you know, we're able to distribute these, you know, the reading kits within those communities that are using A to I to again support that, that those learning so that when the kids do start school, they're starting even that much more ahead. And then on top of that, school readiness in its most general sense is really starting the school year off right, right and being able to start school off right because, you know, that's a big part of, you know, starting school is having your supplies ready. So we actually teamed up with um, one of our, uh, Raymore and Flanagan, which is a furniture company out here, which does a very big school drive, uh, school supply drive for us, as well as other partners in the community. And we were able to distribute over 12 thousand dollars worth of school supplies within the school districts that are that are using the A to I uh, and it's really the need is so there so I just want to tell you a, a funny story that with the little girl in pink um, it's funny but it's really more it shows you how bad the need is is the day that we did that book backpack distribution there uh, there were torrential downpours up until about half an hour before that picture was taken which is why she looks a little wet and the, the event was canceled, and 350 people still showed up, and we actually ran out of backpacks at a canceled event that, you know, families still came out, and that just showed, how, showed us how bad the need was. So, you know, to be able to provide those supplies to those families was a really important aspect of it. But we did more than school readiness. You know, we looked at school uh, summer learning, and, you know, and through our 211 helpline, we have the texting capabilities. And so what we did list this past summer is we used our texting capabilities to reach the parents of the Dixon students who were in the A to I program, and we had actually sent them a different activity to engage with their children every day. And we worked with learning ovations on the actual activities, so it is still kept within the proper learning time frame. Um, and so, but we were able to do that, and we sent those messages out in English and Spanish. And we started off with 54 people registered, and the day before Labor Day, we still had 51 people registered. So we, to only lose three people in that time, we thought it was, it was fantastic. So um, in addition, we also, for summer learning, uh, we attended different block parties that the school districts held and different events that the school districts held. And in addition to giving out books, we, gave, we had experiences. And this was another eye-opening um, piece for me, day for me, because w when you go to some urban areas, they don't know how to fish. And I never even dawned on me until we actually, right here you see, you know, this child that you see is three years old playing with it. Um, but we were like the hit of the party. And we had middle, we, we had like eight and nine year olds trying to fish because they had never used a rod before. And they were just so ecstatic to be able to be able to do this. So to be able to provide those experiences and cause the brain to really think about was really eye-opening. So being able to provide those, you know, types of opportunities, we found was really important. Also, another key component with the, you know, with the campaign is having successful parents. You know, um, we know that having, you know, parents being able to de-stress them a little bit or help them, you know, become more self-sufficient and thrive really helps, you know, helps the children also. So through our gifts and kind program, we're able to provide basic need items. Uh, what you're seeing in the picture on the left, we do uh, a pop-up shop within our front conference room uh, where different nonprofits are able to get uh, some of these activity, these um, items. But we give out bedding, we give out clothing, you know, uh, we actually, uh, we go from furniture to, you know, uh, the school supplies, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but by working through our, um, our corporate partners, we're able to help them get items that they may not be able to afford otherwise. Uh, so we have that, 
And then we also promote, you know, financial stability and promote financial literacy through our Alice Sense program, where we teamed up with Best Money Moves and Saver Life, and we actually incentivize and gamified uh, financial literacy so that we can help families become self-sufficient. Additionally, we also have um, through our actual uh, our actual United Way is a 211 call center. So we're very passionate about 211 in this in this office, um, and 211's uh, helpline is does information and referral needs to the parents whenever they're necessary. We're actually in all of the schools that we work with. They have a parent resource information area, and we you know we incorporate 211 into that information, uh, whether it be that they there's a, a direct uh, phone for for them to call 211 or having the information there. It's been, you know, great to have those things. And then we also have a workforce development program also. So those are the ways that, you know, we, some of the ways that we actually incorporate the pillars of the campaign into our programs. All right. Thank you, Faith. Um, that was a really helpful um, overview. Um, Todd, I'd, I'd like to pull you into the conversation on the, on the other coast. Um, so I, I wonder if you could start by giving us a little bit of background into OC Reads. Um, you all are the campaign lead there in Orange County and the work that you and other funders in your collaborative have been doing to support children's literacy development in Orange County. Of course, thanks Monroe. Um, yeah, a lot of similarities to what Dr. Way is doing, so I'll get through this fairly quickly and just highlight the parts that are different. So, um, our campaign is a collaboration of some funders that are trying to make a difference in literacy rates. Um, if you look at our demographics, we're the sixth largest county in the country. Um, we're very diverse. And most people think of Orange County, you know, as beaches and Disneyland, but we have, you know, a lot of challenges here also. Um, we have a really good assessment tool, I'm going to talk about in a moment, where we're able to um, really get good data on school readiness. And that report showed about half of our kids really have the skills they need when they enter kindergarten. And of course, our, our standardized tests show that only half are meeting achievement standards for, for reading a third grade. So as we do as funders, we look at where there's gaps in the county, where there's needs, where we can apply those resources. Um, so uh, next slide. Yeah, as community foundation, you can go through all these real quick, um, just to the, bring on all four things. <laughs> So uh, really what funders have to do is partner together and that's what we do because there's no one funder that has enough resources you know, to really tackle the need the way that it needs to be done. And so the community foundation partners with many other um, foundations and donors on a lot of initiatives. Uh, let's go to the next slide about um, OC Reads. So this one was led by a big funder in Orange County called the First Five Commission. And in California, we have a, a big tobacco tax that generates a lot of revenue, and that's restricted to program zero to five. And it's a quasi-government organization that focuses just on child health and well-being. And so they're the organization that did the early development index study, and then came to the Community Foundation and United Way to partner to tackle the literacy problem in Orange County. And we also got together all the districts and other organizations to create a, a task force. Our, our vision pretty straightforward. We want everyone to be reading at, at grade level by third grade. And um, just like other funders, you know, the way you got to figure out what, where do we need to apply our resources. Uh, we targeted the areas that had the most need based on two tools, the uh, greater uh, the Smarter Balance Test Scores for third grade, and then the Early Development Index. And if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna tell you a little more what that is. This is a program developed in Canada that um, assesses every single kindergartner on five different categories. And uh, the, the data then is fed back up to a county-wide system, which breaks it down you know, by district, by school, by census tract. And so the slide you're looking at here shows you the data for one school district in Newport Beach. 
uh, based on this on the information achieved and it shows that of kids entering a little more than half have the appropriate gross motor skills and you can see social competency uh, pro-social behavior uh, so this is the study that helped us determine where we were going to target so the schools that had the lowest rates there and the lowest scores came up as uh, where we're going to focus our funding the most. And we go to the next slide. So we identified six that were eligible for funding that had the greatest need based on those two assessments. And we invited them to apply for funding. Uh, however, it wasn't a super easy process. And, and most you know districts, this isn't how they like to operate. And it's it's really tough for a foundation to tell anyone what to do. You know? So really we had to say, okay, we have money and if you have a good initiative, then we're gonna help make it possible in ways that we can. And based on that, we had um, four districts apply for funding in partnership with other organizations. And um, next slide. So that was from 2016 to 2018. And what I can tell you is very few of those worked. Um, but that's okay. As a funder, we had to take risks sometimes, and we knew some of, some of these may or may not work, and most of them didn't. <laughs> but uh, we're committed to this campaign for at least 15 or 20 years, because it takes a long time to really change how things are done and get the outcomes that we need. And um, so what am I pleased to share on this slide here is we are now focused on two programs. Um, as Faith mentioned earlier, iReady is a very popular program and we have one district implementing that, getting good results. But we were super excited about uh, United to Read or A2I, learning ovations, all the same thing. Uh, as a funder, you know, you're approached with many different opportunities and ideas and projects. And this was one of the easiest decisions we ever made is funding this program in one of our school districts. And um, our hope is to grow this into multiple school districts. However, it, for that to happen, uh, there's a lot of work the school must do and contribute to implement the AT2I program. One of the biggest is they need to have their classrooms uh, adapted to small group study. And in California, we have fairly large classrooms. And unless the, the school is already gone in that direction, that's a big step to take to implement the A2I correctly. But this is the hope of a funder is, is, as Faith mentioned too, when you get results like this, other people look to it and if they can see the positive results that the A2I is getting in Anaheim, then other districts will start to implement this. And we're gonna continue funding this for many years and expanding in many districts. Um, to get the results that we're, we're hoping for. All right, thank you, Todd. Um, Angela, I'd, I'd love to um, get your um, thoughts. You've heard from all of our panelists and um, you know, Mississippi has done a great deal of work at the state level to ensure that the science of reading is being applied in classrooms. Um, given your experience and partnership with state leaders there, I'm curious what your reflections are and what you've heard today and what advice would you give offer to others that are on the webinar, uh, given what you've seen in districts across your state. Thanks so much, Monroe, and um, thank you to the panelists who shared. It was great to um, hear from all of you and to learn. Um, you know, we're all in this together and we want to ensure that all children um, read on grade level by the end of grade three and continue that um, progress. So in thinking um, about the presentations today, I'm just super impressed with our two um, funders who have decided that they will embrace the science of reading to ensure that folks who are coming to them seeking funds or either they're advocating um, in their districts or across their communities to ensure that kids have, um, have opportunities where educators and other folks within the system and within the community embrace the science of reading. So kudos to you two for um, ensuring that, that that occurs in your community. And it's, it's really important for our funders 
um, to hold grantees accountable for um, the work they're doing in the community because ultimately it is about changing outcomes for children. I think Todd mentioned that um, last. So that's, that's super impressive and I'm excited to see that. Also in thinking about um, Sarah's presentation, it, I was reminded, um, you know, the one statement that I think she shared a couple of times, different kids need different things to be successful um, the science of reading provides that, um, I guess, a, a good way to think about it um, in using Scarborough's rope. Those are the instructional ingredients that we need in place. And they're, um, you know, kids, all kids need that. But how we um, approach that as educators and making sure that we're being intentional and purposeful across the system. Um, and in order to do that, you really have to think about the capacity um, of educators across that system of support that kids need. So my advice um, for folks who are, are pondering, thinking about the science of reading and um, implementation is to be hyper-focused on educator capacity. Um, that's where the rubber meets the road and that's where we know we can impact outcomes for children. So in Mississippi, um, we, we took that route and really started thinking about what would it take for teachers across the state to, um, to understand the science. And we knew that we had a huge, huge gap um, and a steep learning curve when we um, when our legislature passed our third grade promotion policy. And so with that, um, our State Department of Education started thinking about, okay, what, what is it we need to do um, to ensure that our educators do have the capacity to meet the needs of children so that children and students are successful and can promote to fourth grade. So the, the avenue through a procurement process that um, Mississippi chose was to um, utilize Voyager Cypress Learning's letters, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. Um, and we started with that um, professional learning opportunity back in the spring of 2014. So since that time, as you can tell on the slide, over 15,000 educators across our state including um, faculty members from our institutions of higher learning have participated in um, this training opportunity. Um, so thinking further along the, the, the way there, um, we also realized that, okay, just because teachers have that content knowledge, our educators have the content knowledge, what will it take for that to um, actually translate into classroom practice. Um, so going back to Sarah's comment about, you know, the teacher feels all alone, we knew that literacy coaches in selected schools and in um, other schools where the district provided um, the literacy coach, that that was going to be super important. Teachers need that support to translate that knowledge um, the science of reading knowledge as delivered through the letters um, professional learning. That job embedded um, support would be critical to, um, to ensuring outcomes for children and that our um, outcomes um, would certainly improve. And in Mississippi, we know that across the nation, we were the um, I, I get, we received the most pointed fingers as in thank God for Mississippi um, because we were always on the bottom and thank, thankfully we are no longer on the bottom. Um, so we knew that, that we had a, a heavy lift and that educator capacity was, was um, critical. So in these selected um, literacy support schools, the, the literacy coaches um, were there to, as you can tell from this role um, on the slide, that they were there to support 
um, teachers across the board to ensure that um, kids um, where their literacy outcomes would um, improve and change. In addition to that framework, as far as the role that literacy coaches played in the select um, support schools, there were also um, non-negotiables developed by our um, State Department of Education literacy team. And these are tweaked every single year. So this is for 1920. And you'll see that there were 11 um, non-negotiables. Some of these have not changed, some have changed. Um, but I think this helps with what we saw um, previously as far as systems alignment, that these literacy coaches have received their own professional learning and they're then able to go in um, and support um, schools across this framework so that they um, are that schools and teachers and um, all the professionals in that school building are able to um, meet the needs of our students. And one thing I will say about the science of reading, while those basic ingredients of um, and strands of Scarborough's rope, um, I think are forever and ever there, um, those will not change. We do know that we see more and more research around um, the specifics, getting into the weeds. And we know that that non-negotiable number three, we're starting to think about, okay, really, maybe we need to be thinking about sound walls versus word walls. So, um, you know, we learn. And so when we know better, we do better. Um, so that's a, a conversation we're beginning to have in Mississippi. Now, I have to say that I'm a partner um, and thankfully have been able to um, work with our Department of Education. They, those friends um, on our literacy team and across our Department of Education, um, they're on the ground doing the heavy lifting, the hard work every single day. It is not easy, um, but we are beginning to see some really strong outcomes for children. And I'll just point you to one um, study that was conducted and the report was released back in the spring of 2017, so three years into implementation. Um, this was conducted by the um, RL Southeast housed at Florida State University um, in collaboration with our Department of Education. So we wanted to know, were we seeing um, in classrooms and um, was that knowledge that um, teachers and educators were being, they were being presented that science of reading knowledge. So one, was their knowledge base increasing around the science of reading after participating? And then also did that um, translate into classroom practice? So that's a, um, a, a about a 12 to 15 page report that um, really provides more information about um, those initial results. And, and what we did find is yes, um, the professional development opportunities did make a difference in content knowledge and um, it did translate into classroom practice. So thank you. We're excited to, to be here. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate it and appreciate that um, perspective you gave given all of the great work that you and your colleagues in Mississippi has been, have been doing. Um, so we've been getting some great questions and um, we appreciate those, uh, the, the folks that have sent questions. Um, we certainly wanna invite um, those of you that um, have not yet submitted a question to please do so in the Q&A um, box. But I'm gonna go ahead and start with um, some of the ones that have already started to come in. Um, Sarah, uh, I'm gonna start with you. Um, there's some questions about um, different curricula and reading programs, some question about is A2I a, a curriculum or set of instructional materials? Can you help folks understand this question about what curricula um, uh, these, uh, the, the schools that um, were, were represented here today were using and, and what's the difference between A2I and, and uh, different curriculum? 
Absolutely. Um, so the way I usually think about A2I is a teacher planning tool. And so we know, like I described, it takes a lot of work for alignment and all of these different components to um, help a teacher. But then we also want to make sure we're using the resources they're also familiar with, leveraging what is realistic for a district to provide, all those different pieces. So the A2I recommendations are, can actually be indexed to any curriculum or evidence-based materials a school or a teacher is using. So if we provide the minute recommendations, which is the main component of the actual software platform, then our coaching uh, is provided to support a teacher implementing those and our indexing provides actual recommendations from the curriculum a teacher or a school already has that would meet those needs. So we're really pulling all those components again and aligning them, but it's the A2I piece is really that um, minute recommendation, the research-based um, student needs, and then putting it into action is the support. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, Angela, one of the things you said was, you know, it struck me was you talked about um, we need to be hyper focused on educator capacity and thinking about this time of um, COVID-19. There's a lot of um, instruction that is being done online and remotely. I'm curious what you are thinking about in terms of how should we be thinking about educator capacity, particularly as we look um, forward to the next school year? That's a really great question. And I think um, in addition to having the, the literacy and science of reading content knowledge, teachers are going to need some professional su learning support on how do I deliver that? I know it, I can do it in a face-to-face -face setting, but how do I deliver that in a virtual setting? Um, and we've seen some really great examples um, of folks who have posted videos of um, instruction. Um, I think the ingredients are the ingredients and we as the adults have to determine um, the best way to present that to um, our students virtually. And as we all know that that is a um, is a we've seen that inequity um, in access as far as devices and um, as well as internet access. So how do then we as a system um, support children and families who do not have that access? Um, and that's a heavy lift for a parent who um, isn't, that's, that, but we also know that the parent is the first teacher. So how do we equip them if we can't um, deliver that instruction? So I think we have lots of things to consider and that's a really great question, Monroe. Well, if someone asked it, it wasn't me, but um, Sarah, to you, similar question, but um, one, of the, um, one of the participants asked today, um, what does teacher managed mean in the time of COVID when, you know, as I asked Angela, we're trying to deliver instruction remotely. How, how can you possibly do that? What is that? you have any ideas about what that looks like? Sure. And um, as you can imagine, we've been thinking about this a lot, especially for our current partner schools, but just as how we can get these recommendations that we know work for kids into the hands of anyone who is really instructing um, students right now, which a lot of times does mean parents or a caregiver. Um, so the big takeaway from our research that I always go back to is um, time with the teacher is four to 10 times more effective. And that's especially true for younger students. So the more that we can just make sure the content for these students is available to whoever the adult is providing that, we really just wanna focus that time in then for what the child needs most. If you only have 10 or 15 minutes and it is an adult um, that's a caregiver and not an educator providing that, are they spending time in the most valuable area? Um, and so that's how we've kind of been thinking about it is you know, we know that the school day will look a lot different virtually, but if instead of a two hour literacy block, you now have 15 minutes, that's your teacher managed time now and how, what are you focusing on to give that student what they need right at that minute? Okay, um, thank you. Um, Faith, um, one of the things that struck me in that slide that you showed of kind of the iReady um, scores over time was actually the final number, which was 2022. And it was a target for English language arts of 75%. And so we're talking about a school that had 38% of their K2 students meeting or exceeding benchmark on the iReady in 2018 and setting a really aggressive target of 75%. Um, to me, that says a lot about mindset as well and beliefs. And so I'm curious about what you've seen 
in terms of uh, changes and beliefs around what's possible. And if possible, could you relate this to how we need to be thinking about this kind of current COVID-19 environment? And again, thinking about what's possible and what expectations we're setting for ourselves and our children. Right, so 2018, we're talking that's June 2018, so that's before the study happened. So to see that in 2019, the first year of the study, where only the K and, uh, K and first graders used A to I to bring it up to 67% was, was fantastic, to then by, you know, by 2022, K1 and 2 will all have been using A to I, that's how they're able to see such a drastic, you know, goal. And they were actually being conservative. They were they're actually on target to have a higher mark in 2022. Um, with that being said, with the COVID-19, uh, and I know I, that I sound at this point like a learning ovations, uh, you know, mouthpiece, but they, you know, the tools that they provide and that we're working with the school districts, they actually provided a, a home tool for, you know, for parents to be able to use during, during this period, you know, to be able to help the school districts and, and, and the parents work together for, to determine what the children actually need right now. So, like, in, in moving ahead and realizing, you know, we have to figure out other ways to be able to reach our, the children or things that we can do over the summer, we've got to, we can't necessarily just think about the way we've always done things. We have to figure out new ways to do things and what tools we have available and also breaking down the silos and really being able to embrace somebody else's good idea and working with them because we can't do it on our own, you know? So together, you know, we, we're stronger. So right. that's really. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Sarah, um, back to you. There was a question that just came in that um, someone was asking about, um, has um, uh, this, are, you, you mentioned alignment to curricular materials. The ask has has already been aligned to any particular curriculum. Yes. So in our current districts, um, like I said, we part of our service is aligning to curriculum. So if it's not on the list, I'm about to say part of what we do is make sure that it is in our system before A2I is implemented. But currently, um, benchmarks, wonders, and Nat Geo are our most popular. And then we have many other supplemental materials in there as well. And then we're actively indexing currently um, some additional open source materials. Um, we also have Engage New York and then EL Education is another one that we're aligning to. All right, thank you. Um, Todd, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, here in Charlotte, there are a number of nonprofits that are having to adjust um, in kind of this current environment where you're not able to get into schools. And, you know, we still have this concern about supporting children and families. and I wonder from the funder perspective, as you're looking at how you, you know, look to continue make investments and in programs that are grounded in the science of reading, um, you know, how should, um, you know, the nonprofits, and we've got nonprofits, you know, on the webinar today, be thinking about how they adjust um, their own service delivery when you're not able to, you know, get into schools or physically be proximate to, uh, to children. Oh, good question. And I actually don't have the answer to how they should. I, I can tell you, I am hearing from all of them. We, we created a very large fund to help all the nonprofits called a resilience fund. And so they all applied for support and everyone was responding differently in terms of how they're going to help. Um, and yeah, so I don't have any great advice other than they need to partner with others and their districts. So what doesn't usually work is when they just try to work in silos and, and provide piecemeal support. But uh, I guess right now, any sort of extra support is beneficial. All right, thank you. Um, one of the questions we got was about um, dual language learners or second language learners. Um, I know we, it, it's a growing important population here in Charlotte and I know in both of your communities. Um, Sarah, I'm curious, um, is any of the research show um, whether, you know, how, how does the science of reading and what you described, um, you know, and what have you seen as how it applies to uh, second language learners? Sure. Um, and something that uh, we're really hoping to have out soon is our um, 
study on English language learners in Arizona specifically, where we really dug into this and um, tested whether the recommendations that are coming from A2I are effective in populations like that as well. Um, and so uh, while the publication isn't out yet, I can tell you, yes, um, we were able to adjust the algorithms and make sure it did work for those populations. And what we found is that um, we really start to see an emphasis and a need for um, both assessments and then instruction on vocabulary and oral language. So there's a lot of focus on foundational skills, decoding currently, but again, when we think about those different student profiles for our English language learner students, they need a lot more time in teacher managed and um, meaning focused instruction. So they're not only learning those decoding foundational skills, but also making sure that you know, those two lines are coming together in that initial graph of, you know, the vocabulary and their understanding of what they're reading is supported as well. All right, thank you. Um, I also want to remind you all there's a poll uh, that just uh, popped up. Um, it's really important um, for these webinars that we get feedback from you about um, how we're doing. So um, please uh, hope that you will take time to fill out the uh, survey poll and give us feedback. Um, so, um, one of the questions, Angela, I'm curious about um, is um, thinking about how we, uh, if you think about it at a systems level, how do we provide support um, to, to teachers to be able to effectively use uh, instructional materials? And one of Sarah's slides showed kind of like the, the difference between research and practice. And um, I know you all have put a lot of effort into coaches and coaching in Mississippi. Um, I'm curious about um, have there been major takeaways that you all have um, discovered from your work about how do you effectively um, coach teachers that may be coming in with different amounts of knowledge about, you know, reading instruction or the science of reading? Um, you know, what have been some of the most successful things that you all have learned that um, our participants today in the webinar might want to know and take back to their communities? Thanks, Monroe. So I think um, similarly, as we approach instructing our students, um, very much the same with supporting teachers. So once they have those foundational science of reading um, takeaways, key takeaways, then the amount of support that they'll need um, to translate that into practice um, will vary. Um, some teachers are going to dig in and really um, own it and rock it and some teachers are going to need much much more support um, and some teachers have very um, different um, belief systems so it's hard more um, difficult to work with those teachers um, but I think what we've seen across the um, the state obviously there are outliers but if you keep the focus for teachers on their students and that data, they all want their students to do well. So taking them back to the data and being able to show them what we're doing is working. Um, I think it's something that we don't always um, highlight as educators um, and within our systems that really Yes, we're the adults, but it's not about us. It's about the students. So as much as possible, getting them back to the student level data to say, look, you tweaked this and now look at the data. So I'm not sure I actually answered that in um, maybe in a roundabout way. No, that was great. You know, one of the things that Todd mentioned was um, kind of the more focus, I think I heard, I heard you say, Todd, on small group instruction. Um, and I'm curious, um, Angela, what, what, what you've all seen in Mississippi around this whole class versus small group instruction and how much of your time has been, had to be to focus on that? So I would imagine that each, um, that there, there are guidelines that the department has as far as um, what that needs to look like in those non-negotiables. Um, but it also is determined by um, the, the students in the classroom. Um, I think small group instruction is critical for meeting the needs of all students. But I also think that there's an um, absolutely um, 
opportunities for whole group instruction. And if we look at what Tim Shanahan um, and um, highly respected reading researcher um, is that, you know, sometimes we, in our efforts to, to um, ensure that we meet the needs of all children, that um, we're not always meeting the needs of any, ch of any child um, by spending so much time on small group instruction. So I think there's a sweet spot that we have to really be careful and cognizant um, and not, um, you know, not leave students to their own devices. Um, but I, th I always think about purposeful practice um, and holding kids accountable for the practice we, um, we have them completing when we are in small groups with, um, with the, at the teacher table. Okay, yeah, um, well put. Uh, Sarah, um, question about assessments. So, you know, uh, here in North Carolina, um, we've had a lot of assessments across the state. Um, you know, schools um, sometimes are doing assessments on top of assessments. So I'm, I'm curious if you could just help us understand who administers the HOI assessments, how much time does this take? Um, how, how do schools fit this in? Definitely. Um, so one of the things we really focus on um, for the HOI assessments is making sure they're easy. Um, easy to give, easy for the students to take independently and not burdening teachers in that way. So our assessments measure vocabulary, decoding, and comprehension. So those three components that have come up um, continuously, those are what we really need to drive those recommendation algorithms. Um, but they're online and adaptive. So the tests take about 10 to 15 minutes. Usually it's about 20 minutes total. Um, and there's two assessments that give us those three pieces of data that we need. And then um, those will drive the algorithms until the next testing occasion. And we actually can take time into account. So even if a new assessment data isn't in there, because months of the school year are passing, our algorithms are actually updating. So the teachers, we usually recommend about every six weeks, but um, some districts opt to take them um, fewer than that. And we still have accurate recommendations because our system can kind of account for that variability. Um, so they're usually done in the classroom in um, a child group, you know, four or five students at a time, but our goal is to really limit the impact on instructional time to get those assessments completed. All right, thank you. Well, it looks like we are coming to the end of our 90 minutes together. So I'd um, like to jump in and um, give everybody one more reminder and chance to f fill out the brief survey poll that Monroe Rent mentioned earlier. It should have popped up on your screen. We're going to leave it open until we officially close out the webinar. So I encourage you to take a moment um, to share your thoughts and feedback on that right now. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to our amazing presentation team today. Um, for joining us and sharing their work and their insights and their lessons learned during this critical moment in time. Thank you to Sarah Spiegel, to Faith Ann Butcher, to Todd Hansen, and to Angela Rutherford. And thank you again to our wonderful moderator, Monroe Richardson, for helping to plan today's conversation and then guiding us through this exploration together today. And I'd also like to say, say thank you to all of you who tuned in today. I hope you found it helpful and informative. There were um, a couple of questions and a lot of interest, it seemed like, in this um, challenge that we're facing right now in terms of supporting children and families while we are not in school and not in early learning programs and the, the need in the, the ways that we're using uh, digital devices to support them in this moment. Um, and recognizing the inequities um, in terms of access to those devices, access to the connectivity to make them useful for children and families. So I just wanted to bring your attention to the um, webinar that we have scheduled for next week at 3 p.m., which will be digging into these digital inequities and um, lifting them up and figuring out strategies for addressing them so that we can support children um, and families and their uh, literacy development during this time when we are being um, safe and socially distanced and not in um, learning programs. Um, next, uh, and then, you know, we've got, um, of course, just another reminder that next week we will have this double header that we've started having more frequently with two sessions um, on Tuesday, including the 1230 to 2 p.m. session, looking at, again, you know, children out of, early learning children out of um, their early learning programs, not having access to Head Start and the preschool and pre-K programs, and then they're headed into our uh, 
kindergarten classrooms and public schools in the fall. And so what can we do to support their foundational de skill development um, during this time? Um, so I hope you will tune in for both of those conversations next week and continue to join in for more of these online learning sessions. Um, until then, I hope that you will take care and be safe. And thank you again to our presenters, our moderator, uh, commentator, and to you all for joining in. Bye-bye.